First of all, I'd like to acknowledge that I've spent much of my career on Tanarong, Gunakurnai and Wurundjeri country. And towards the end of the talk, we'll be uh, focusing a little bit on Onawal and Wiradjuri country. Um, so really, this is about thinking about the state of the forest and the recovery challenge. And really, I think it's important to, to acknowledge that this was a very brave decision. As Sir Humphrey might have said, uh, yes, Prime Minister, it was a, a very courageous decision. But I think it also at the same time creates huge opportunities economically and environmentally in this space. And it's an opportunity to shift our forest to a, a better place and think about what protection entails. And I think it's really important in this space that decision makers are well informed. So part of this talk is a little bit provocative because it's about some myth busting. And there's certainly been a lot of myths that's gone on in the forest space for the last four decades. So the state of the forest, then the restoration challenge and some of the opportunities that are associated with that. So my own background goes back to July 1983, and we've had a, uh, nearly four decades of intensive research in that space with a lot of peer-reviewed papers, a lot of scientific measurements that are still going, literally to this day. And what we see from that is that the wood production forests are in a pretty rough state. They are heavily overcut. We've actually looked through environmental and uh, economic accounting at the state of the forest in terms of what's there. And there is evidence of significant overcutting that actually goes back a long way, back to the 1930s. You can see it in historical documents. The forest is extensively fragmented. Some work that was led by Chris Taylor essentially shows that. Um, we see that there's very substantial declines in very large trees something that I know is, is very difficult for people like Mandy and, and Wurundjeri people to deal with. There's been strong associated losses of biodiversity linked with that. There's actually a process and a pattern. And we also see that forests are very flammable. And we're gonna come back to that in a moment. The evidence is overwhelming now in that space. And there's no doubt from an economic perspective that the native forest logging industry was a major loss maker for the state. So let's, let's dig into this a little bit more. This is not an unusual scene from uh, particular vantage points across many parts of the Central Highlands area where much of the logging was focused, particularly in the last 10 to 20 years, about 70% of logging operations in this area. And you can see where the, the boundaries of the logging coops are relative to uh, the ages that they were cut and here's an ANU long-term site here. And the landscape's changed repeatedly over time. It's called a time-varying covariate in these environments. And here's another image of another landscape in the background. And Chris's work on the extent of fragmentation indicates that in the wood production forest, you only had to walk 71 metres from a randomly selected point to a disturbance boundary, which is a logging coop or a, a logging road. So on top of that, when we look at statewide what's happened, we've seen a nearly 80% decline in old growth forests since 1995. And in part, that was actually associated previous to that with deliberate policies, state government policies to liquidate old growth forests. The word liquidate was actually used in historical documents. And we've seen widespread regeneration failure. And this is something that we're working on at the moment uh, with satellite data and with drone technology. But regeneration failure is very widespread, not only due to recurrent fire, but also post logging, as, as we can see in these kinds of places. So you can see some of the places where there are trees and large areas where there are not trees. What we also see is that one of the most iconic parts of our forest, these very large old trees, and this one is a Firmiston tree, and you can see the entire village of Fernshill around uh, that individual tree. Large trees don't move very much, and you can mark them. And this is the, the late Dave Blair measuring some of these trees. And this is our longest running project, dating right back to July 1983. And we can document how quickly they're falling over. 
and how quickly they're being recruited. And what we see is this. This is the precipitous decline of large old trees as a keystone component of these forests. What we also see is that in these kinds of forests that are very <coughs> species rich, some species are declining very quickly, like the greater glider. And our latest work is actually through structured, structured equation modelling, being able to show that there's a strong link between declines of species and declines in the structure of the forest, particularly these large old trees. So there's a clear pattern and a process that underlines the pattern based on the last four decades of work. What we also see is that the forest really is a lot more flammable. Now, there's no doubt that this is strongly associated with changes in climate. For example, since I've been on the planet, just a bit over 60 years, the number of high forest fire danger index days is 10 times what it was in 1960. But logging is also making these forests more flammable. And as Phil Zilstra may or may not talk about, but he's done some fantastic work in this space, there is also uh, a risk of increased flammability due to hazard reduction burning. And it's based on an understanding of how forests work. So what we know is that the size and prevalence of fire is increasing and the uniformity of fire is also changing. So we're seeing much larger fires over much larger areas more frequently and they're much more uniform. And this is some work that we published earlier this year looking at the frequency of fire and uh, the extent of fire across, across uh, northeastern Victoria and through to central Victoria. So some other work is indicating that some places that should burn only once every 75 to 150 years are now burning three or four times in the last 25. And if we look at it globally, and this is some work that will be published in the next few weeks, Australia is actually doing very, very badly in this space. So we've analysed uh, the frequency of high severity fire in the last two decades, and we can see, for example, the burn trend is Australia in bright red and other places uh, likewise. What we see is that the area of forest, particularly wood production forest that's being lost to fire, is increasing quite dramatically. In fact, Australia does worse than anywhere else in the world bar one, and that's Portugal. So this is really important because it means that the extent of very high severity fire means that it's almost impossible to maintain an industry based on saw logs with that frequency of fire. We also see when we look at the footprint of the black summer fires, two key things. So um, the summary of that reanalysis of those data indicates that log forests nearly always burn at higher severity and log forests burning under moderate fire conditions still burn more severely than intact forests burning under extreme conditions. So just have a think about what, what's happening there in terms of the elevated fire severity risk. And some other work led by Jeff Carey, um, a modeler at the ANU, indicates that there's a less than 20% chance that trees growing will grow through to an 80 year period to be of saw log age in these systems. So that's the fire side of things. The economic side is pretty grim. So if you look at, for example, Vic Forest's own corporate and business plans, they've known for a long time that logging operations are actually not commercial in significant parts of their estates. So this is for East Gippsland. Timber harvesting in its current form in East Gippsland, that's the largest forest management area in Victoria, is not commercial. So this was not just recently. This is 2014, 2013, so this is a decade old. Okay, so that's the basis for what's going, going on. If you look in detail, as we've had a forensic accountant do, Vic Forest is actually insolvent. This is not a commercial enterprise to be able to do native forest logging in this state. And I would suggest that probably the science had very little to do with the government's decision. It was more that uh, it was uneconomic the state was hemorrhaging large amounts of money in this space. And when you do economic and environmental accounting, as Heather Keith had done in, 19, uh, sorry, in 2017 and published the work in Nature, Ecology and Evolution, you can see that the scale of the native forest logging industry is actually very small relative to some of the other values of the forest. <coughs> 
Okay, so in essence, what's really happening here is that native forest logging was value subtracting from the, the natural values of the system rather than adding. So it wasn't a value added proposition. So now we have a restoration challenge. We have to try to significantly regrow the old growth estate. We're going to have to put forest back where it should be, but re restoration uh, is going to be needed because regeneration has failed. We're going to have to we're going to have to restore the natural fire regime, which means largely an absence of fire from tall, wet forests. And Chris Taylor is going to talk more about that later. And we've got to think about hazard reduction burning. I need to probably reshape that, given what Phil Zilstra has just been finding. And we're going to have to recover iconic species. So there's been a lot of discussion about the nature repair market in this space and bringing extra finance in to help us with these restoration challenges. When you look at what actually is happening in the private sector, this is a paper published just a couple of weeks ago, what is happening is that most of the restoration programs supported through uh, finance in the private sector are actually greenwashed. There is actually no credible monitoring to tell you how you're performing in that space. That's a very important paper to think about in this context. And I think so what that tells us is that our restoration programs are going to need to be very carefully monitored and are going to have to have very important guardrails around them so that we can actually monitor the restoration invention, interventions. We're going to have to collect data properly to be able to understand whether or not restoration is really working. And we're going to have to, to look for the biodiversity dividend associated with that intervention. And for example, compare it against the baseline, for, uh, for instance, over the last 40 years of key data in this space. And those data are going to need to be transparent to all the stakeholders. And the monitoring itself will have to be independent from who's benefiting in a nature repair market. Otherwise, it'll be gained, as it has been for the last 20 years, according to that paper by Lamont. And if we're going to, to think about this, the reality is that biodiversity is an important cost in this space. And it's about, monitoring is about 10% of your program cost. And if we're going to have investors involved, then we have to create metrics to show real progress in this space. So in the restoration challenge, we're going to have to, we're going to, have to reverse that 100-year impact of liquidating old growth forests. You can go back to the historical documents. Chris Taylor's dug them out, Forest Commission of Victoria 1928, get rid of old growth forest. Go right through to the Ferguson Inquiry in 1985, get rid of old growth forest. It's, it's there. So we really do have to stop logging. And we have to do that to stem the financial losses that goes with logging. It's a non-commercial enterprise. It loses a lot of money. We've got to move away from salvage logging because it's the most damaging form of logging of all. Uh, and that includes after wind throw. It's still very damaging. We have to move away from commercial thinning because A, it doesn't make any money. And as we'll see later, it actually has other problems. And we've got to be very smart about our fire management and think deeply about the alternative employment opportunities. So we know that nearly 40% of wood production landscapes have failed regeneration. The log landings, the sneak tracks, and, and areas such as in the background here that simply haven't regenerated at all. So that's a big issue to get trees back in the landscape. And it's going to be an intensive exercise to put those trees back. We also know that we have a lot of these things. Uh, I saw one yesterday in the temperate woodlands of, of uh, Western New South Wales on farms. There are millions of samba deer, red deer, rooster deer and others. And what we see is that often their impacts are concentrated where there's been logging in the past or recent fire. That's where the tastiest plants are. So it's really important to think about when we're doing natural regeneration to tackle some of the other drivers of the problem, which include these feral herbivores. But there's an opportunity for an industry there with uh, wild caught venison. And then we've got some iconic species that are really in a lot of trouble. And so we've thought deeply about how we can bring this iconic animal back because it's declining in many parts of its distribution, including in, in some of these forests, and thinking deeply about the kinds of nest boxes that, and artificial hollows that you would need to put back 
in the system for animals like this that are actually very heat sensitive. These animals don't deal with high overnight temperatures, but they're very important sentinel animals. They don't respond well to logging or fire or land clearing or climate change and combinations of all of those. So we've had nest boxes in our temperature controlled rooms at ANU, looking at what kinds of paints we can use, looking at what kinds of paints we use to also make these nest boxes more um, resistant to, to fire. And we need to think about where these animals used to occur in the landscape with these long-term data sets, where the landscape is coolest given its heat sensitivity, and where we would start to focus uh, these kinds of recovery programs using the best available science to take us to a better place. And we know that prescribed burns can have significant effects on wildlife. Phil Zilstra has done some really elegant work on the related western ringtail possum in this space. So we still have this challenge about what are we going to do with these highly flammable forests that we've created from the last hundred years uh, in, this, in this space. So one of the questions that we've often been, been asked is, will thinning help us solve this problem? So our response to that is to look at the data. What does the science show? And so we've looked at this after two fires, 2009 and the Black Summer fires, and the answer is generally thinning doesn't help. And in some cases, it actually has a perverse outcome. So this is really important. To, to engage with this kind of stuff and look at it. And this is not a small study. I've heard people say this is a small study. The, there are many, many hundreds of sites in this with um, some of the, the most robust statistical analysis that you can apply in this space to look at this issue. I think it's really important to dispel some myths around thinning. You know, I've had an, an hour long discussion on a telephone with someone telling me that some of these forests don't self thin. That's called Brandolini's law or the bullshit asymmetry principle. The fact is that Mark Westerby's work shows that these forests do thin and there are power laws that, dis that indicate what the number of stems should be over time. There are some kinds of, of forests that don't thin naturally, like colitis, but even here over prolonged periods of time they do. And that's work by Ian Lunt and others. But also remember that the understory of forests is a critical part of how forests function. It fixes nitrogen for some of the, the overstory trees, it's habitat for many species, and it has a whole series of other roles that are critical parts of how forests function. And then we've got to think about this, this thorny issue of hazard reduction burning. You know, there are a lot of places that have got targets for hazard reduction burning, and that leads to what's called Goodhart's Law, where you actually do the burning in places where it might matter the least, and you might create other problems which Phil just has looked at. And sometimes it doesn't work. You know, the, the problem in Marysville, a place that I'd lived in in the past and had friends that died in 2009, Marysville, you couldn't see in front of your face a couple of months before it burnt down because of the, the smoke created by hazard reduction burning. So when people say, if only we'd done more hazard reduction burning, we wouldn't have had these problems you need to engage with what the science is actually saying in this space. And we get these kinds of, of very sad kinds of situations. This is Marysville uh, that we all know took the brunt of the Black Summer fires in 2000 and uh, the Black Saturday fires in 2009. There is a role for cultural burning. This is on Onawal country um, outside of Canberra, not Ngunnawal, but Onawal country. And this is First Nations-led work, applying First Nations cultural burning to temperate woodland environments and native grasslands. And the, the, the general psyche here is the right fire for the right country. And I would argue that tall, wet forests is not the right country for this kind of fire. And most of the First Nations elders that we've talked to have, have discussed that. There are others much more qualified to speak about that than I am. I think we're going to need to think about new technologies given the, the extent of flammability in some of these environments. And we've thought a lot about this at ANU, working across a whole series of disciplines, be it law, be it uh, mathematical modelling around lightning strikes, be it engineers thinking about what sorts of technologies can be applied in this space, thinking about um, risk reduction 
thinking about lightning strikes, where are they most likely to occur, where are those strikes most likely to, to lead to ignitions, how can we detect those ignitions quickly, and how can we suppress those ignitions very quickly as well with new technologies and, and new thinking. We are in a new space where we have so many more uh, high risk days uh, with temperatures so much higher than we've seen previously. You know, the world at the moment is tracking at 1.2 degrees higher relative to, to our target at 1.5. Australia is 1.47. So we're actually leading the world in terms of uh, getting fastest to the 1.5 level. Just have a think about what that means. So I also think that in recasting a new vision for our forests, we need to think about some of the things that work. So one of the most uh, economically lucrative parts of operations for sustainable timbers Tasmania is actually this. It's the Tarhoon walkway. You, you have to do a lot of work to get there. You have, to you have to go to Hobart and then you have to hire a car and then you have to drive a fair way. But that has rejuvenated uh, many local areas, including places like Jeeveston. And we see the same in Western Australia, in the Valley of the Giants near Walpole. I know both places, Jeeveston and Walpole. Uh, in a previous life, I cycled around both areas, Southwest WA and, uh, and Tasmania. And this kind of infrastructure revolutionises, rejuvenates the economies of some of these areas and really does make a difference uh, to, to, uh, to local communities. And so we've been thinking a lot about this in the context of the Great Forest, which is the Central Highlands wet forests, and what that might entail. And I think there needs to be new models around how we manage those areas that involves co-management. And this is not Victoria, it's not New South Wales, it's Jarvis Bay Territory, and this is Buttery National Park, and it has a very strong co-management approach with um, the Rec Bay community. And on the other side of the bay are the, the Geringer people and their co-management with the Beecroft weapon, Weapons Range. So there are good models for co-management. Will Pina Pound is another one. I'm sorry, but I can't pronounce the name of, of, of that in First Nations language. I apologise for that. I'm not going to butcher it, so I'm not going to, to enter into that space. But they're successful co-management models that have good economic outcomes they have good employment outcomes for some of the most disadvantaged people to be able to work on country doing things and meaningful work in that space. So a map that was created for the Central Highlands area in consultation with First Nations people, I think is really important to, to then think about the kinds of activities that are going to be relevant to, to managing these areas. And that connection with First Nations people we've already seen this morning in, in a very important spiritual context, but also a true connection to country in, in, this, in these areas. You can see Mandy there and the jury jury's doing a sorry dance on log country in Tulangi. So just uh, coming to the last slide, last second last slide, is that I think there are very important and exciting opportunities in this space, including for regional and for First Nations people's employment for meaningful work on country, particularly in the first instance in revegetation programs. There are huge areas of forest that don't grow at the moment where they should be. So there's, a, there's an important space in there. Carbon storage values potentially could be very important, particularly also if there is a value on carbon, there's going to need to be regular carbon assessment and measurement and re-measurement. One of the myths is that if it burns, we lose all the carbon. We measured it before and after fire. Most of the carbon is still in the landscape, particularly when you've got older forests. There's, I think, a huge opportunity in, in feral animal control. We actually really do have to do something in that space. The impacts of, of feral animals like deer are enormous. We've seen it, we've measured it. Other people have done some fantastic work in that space. It's a serious problem that affects uh, natural regeneration and it will affect revegetation efforts if we don't deal with that. And I think that offers opportunities again for things like wild caught venison. I was talking to a landowner yesterday who's got a problem with samba deer on his place, close to, to Wagga. A adult samba deer shot in the right place will fetch $1,000 as a dressed carcass. 
That's not my price. That's his for what he sends it um, for. He thinks that he can shoot about 30 animals every, every, uh, every uh, couple of nights. I think there's opportunities in the cultural burning space, but also the elite firefighting space. So we know from talking to volunteers that that is impossible with lengthening fire seasons to maintain a huge volunteer force given the demands on employers, given the demands on their time, the impacts on their, their mental health and others. And so we do have to have professional firefighting services. You know, our fire seasons are now August until April and other countries have, uh, are looking to us to help them as well. So I think there's big opportunities also around the, the fire detection and suppression technologies all over the world. This is a problem not just in Australia, as we've seen with the global analysis. There are big opportunities in recovering iconic species like the greater glider that we talked about, but there are many others that are dealing with the same kinds of issues. And I think there's a big opportunity in the infrastructure and tourism and ecotourism space. And these are not pie in the sky things. There are people that actually write books on this stuff. And this is an example of one. I have a copy of this that's marked up and I have many, many others on my bookshelf that are literally a metre from where I sit in the mornings most days. There are opportunities to make these transitions. They have worked in many cases. We need to look at the models of what's worked where and why and take the best bits of those and help Victoria to, to take a, a different trajectory than the one that we've had for the last 70 to 80 years. Thanks very much.